Well, I want to welcome everyone to this afternoon's program. Bienvenidos a todos. Uh, I have to say that um, we're, uh, we're very proud and honored this afternoon to be able to provide this program to the community. Um, we've been screening films uh, throughout the festival. Some have been documentaries, some have been features. Um, this film really resonated, and I have to say it's this film that's uh, resulted in pretty much selling out the house, so give yourselves a hand. So once again, my name is Marcella Davis and Aviles. I'm the executive producer of Viva Fest, and uh, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to say thank you and acknowledge uh, some of our sponsors and supporters and the hard work of a, a lot of people that made this event possible before, uh, before we commence. And uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the City of San Jose and the Office of Cultural Affairs and uh, our many donors that if you go to www.vivafest.org, you'll find um, a long list of individual donors, corporate sponsors. Uh, uh, we have uh, received this year actually a major gift from the Tomcat Trust. And uh, th thanks to their generosity and the generosity of the city of San Jose through the Office of Cultural Affairs, Viva Fest was made possible this year. So I do want to give our thanks to them for their vision in supporting what it is that we try to do at, at Viva Fest. I also want to thank the tech. As you can see, we've got three logos up here, and if it wasn't for the generosity of the Board of Trustees of the Tech Museum and the hard work of the tech staff, Elizabeth Williams, Grant at the box office, the marketing department, the building staff, um, the tech has donated their venue to Viva Fest. Uh, so that is huge. Not only that, but all of the revenue that we earn from these programs and screenings comes to us. The tech doesn't take a dime. So, I mean, that's a pretty good deal. And, and I really, really want to thank the leadership of Elizabeth Williams and the Board of Trustees for, of the tech for their, their a collaborative spirit in working with us to make this possible. And then, I, you know, this program and uh, several other programs that we offered at Viva Fest this year uh, are the result of the creativity of Darlene Tennis, who is the CEO and principal of um, a small business, woman-owned, Latina-owned company called Casa Q. <laughs> and as a former small business owner myself, and as uh, someone who has spent many, many years uh, wearing a different hat in the world of financial services and banking as a, as a former banking executive. I know how hard it is to run a small business in the United States today, and Darlene Tennis is at the top of that list of how to do it right. And I want to thank her personally for um, having such a generous and charitable spirit and a collaborative spirit and really having a big vision um, I think she shares the vision of go big or go home, and she certainly went big, and we're all going home with her tonight uh, with this wonderful program. So, uh, want, well, he also has an interesting sense of humor. That's, just, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. So thank you, Darlene. Thank you, Casa Q. And then uh, she's going to follow me to introduce our honored guests, some of whom have traveled literally hundreds and hundreds of miles to be here with us to give us their insights, their wisdom, their experience, uh, their pride uh, of being part of, of our community. And uh, Darlene, I'm looking forward to just start the movie, she says. OK, so I'm going to get out of here. Uh, but real quick, um, this is not the last program of our festival. On November 3rd in San Francisco, we're going to be celebrating Dia de los Muertos, and we're co-presenting with the San Francisco Symphony their Dia de los Muertos concert. 
I do encourage you to attend that. It will be presenting Mariachi Nuevo Tecalitlan from Jalisco, Los Lupeños de San Jose, and Luis Valdez, who will be uh, presenting an uh, original narration that will be celebrating and explaining Dia de los Muertos. And we're very honored to be partnering with the San Francisco Symphony this year to do that. So uh, please visit vivafest.org and learn more about that. And so now I'm getting out of here so we can see the movie. And thank you very much. There are these doomsday theories that the poles are going to flip or solar flares are going to happen. It is a very special time. We will discover we are all pieces of a puzzle. La gente está esperando un cambio. Algunos con miedos, otros con ilusión, otros con incertidumbre. We have the Hopi prophecy of an emergence from one world to another world and the Pachacuti prophecy of the golden age where the three realms converge and uh, the Maori prophecy of the veil will dissolve between this world and the next. All over the world it did seem to actually confirm that there is something going on here about the year 2012. is the only known inscription that has the 2012 date on it. Wow. Everybody wants to know what Tortuguero Monument 6 says about 2012. And we knew. <laughs> There's so many dimensions to the confusion regarding 2012. This is not something that can affect us in any way. I don't think we have enough evidence to suggest that the creators of the long count actually intended that. The rocks are being thrown on both sides. There's no question. I'd like to see that, that schism healed. The Maya had the vision that the cycles of time marched on and on and on. The question is, do people always accompany the drumbeat of time? Well, thank, let's give a big hand for the movie. I'm going to go ahead and invite all the panelists to come up here right now. So we're going to um, respectfully ask that nobody take audio or video recording today um, at all. We, all the panelists have given permission for the Tech Museum only to record this session. It will be available on the Tech Museum website. You can take photos. Of course, if we can see your little iPhone up there for a long period of time, we know that you're not taking photos. Um, so we just respectfully ask again that you do not videotape the panelists. We do not want any of their words to be taken out of context. And excuse me, it'll be on the Viva Fest website as well. So I'm gonna. Oh, here we go. Oh yeah. See, that's there. You go. There's my message for you guys. So these are the panelists we have today. So on the very end, the lovely blonde is Shannon Kring Busset, and she is the the filmmaker and producer, director. So let's give her a big hand again for her film. And just so you know, I'm gonna introduce them more thoroughly once we start with them. I will say one more thing. You have, each of you should have received a card when you came in. Uh, if you have a question, right now is the time to write down that question. And then we have, if you see the lovely tech Museum volunteers, they will gather your cards and we're going to sort them because we know a lot of you will have repeat um, inquiries. 
Did everybody get a card when they came in? No, okay. Um, they, may, may, they might have run out of cards. So Emily or somebody. We're, we're gonna see about getting you guys some more cards. Do they have more cards? If you need a card, there you go. Put your hand up if you need a card. So you can ask a question. And just keep your hand up until a volunteer comes around and give you a card. Again, they're going to start, they're going to be collecting the cards. We're going to sort them out for you. And if we have time at the end, we will get to the questions, um, if time permits. So I'm going to finish introducing the panel. So next we have Dr. Jean Molesky pose and Dr. Isabel Hawkins. Raise your hand, Dr. Isabel. And Dr. Michael Grofe and Don Roberto Paz Perez, who, and this is our, we're very, very, very honored to have Don Roberto. He came all the way from Zanil Quetzaltango today in Guatemala. So we're very happy to have Don Roberto here. And then Don, Doña Maria is the most huggable person. <laughs> so we're very happy to have Doña Maria. She's a Maya elder as well here. So I'm going to start off um, introducing Shannon, and she's going to ask, uh, answer the first question. I want to tell you a little bit about Shannon. And we went to dinner last night. So Shannon, she comes from a really small little town in Wisconsin, 200 people. Everybody's related. That's like a Mexican family gathering, you know? <laughs> 200 people. And now she's traveled over 20 countries, you know, in the world. And she made this, is, and believe it or not, this documentary is her first film she's ever made. And we, and I spent, yeah, to give her a big hand. We screened a tremendous amount of documentaries to pick a good documentary for the Maya calendar. And, and I actually did not see how beautiful she was and did not see like that she had never done a documentary before. We just purely screened the documentaries. And then, um, and then you know, I felt like she did a really good fair view of everything and I was really, really impressed. I'm also impressed with her background. Shannon, actually, she was, um, she was an Emmy Award winning um, cooking show on PBS. She's co-authored a few cookbooks. She had a cooking line of products on QVC. And then she gave it all up. And I'm going to let you tell her, I'm going to let her tell her story. But she gave it all up. And then she, you know, really discovered the whole Maya culture. And so, and she's also been a keynote speaker at events all around the world, and she's been featured on CBS, NBC, ABC, PBS, Fox, you name it, all of them. She's been in Wall Street Journal, Smart Money, Red Book, and she's currently completing her first novel about the Maya culture as well. So I'm gonna go ahead, Shannon, what made you just give up all the cooking <laughs> to do this film? I found that other people made something really good called tortillas, and uh, I liked eating that better. Uh, no, but I was at a crossroads in my life. As Darlene mentioned, I was living in Wisconsin, and I was uh, quote unquote successful in my work, but I felt really unfulfilled. And I went through heartbreak and all sorts of things that many of us in this room go through. And I questioned, where do I go from here? Uh, literally and figuratively. And I decided to go to the place in the world where my heart felt best. Because my heart was hurting, I wanted to go where there's a strong heartbeat. Uh, Copan, Honduras, which was featured in the film, uh, was a place that I'd visited for the first time in 2007. And there was this sound that you heard all day long there, which this making of the tortillas. It really was tortillas that brought me <laughs> into my new life. I decided to go where the heartbeat was strong, where the people were kind and, and seemed strong in ways that I didn't feel at the time. And so in January 2008, I moved to Copan, Honduras. I really brought with me one suitcase. And I just had the goal of growing uh, spiritually, healing myself, and discovering what my higher purpose was in life. I felt that there must have been something, some reason why I came uh, into this life. And the Maya people embraced me with such warmth, and they welcomed me into their lives and into their sacred ceremonies. And I felt like I needed to give something back to them. I really feel that I owe the Maya Chorti people of Copan my life. 
I really mean that. And so every time I would go back home to the US, I would see these documentaries. And they usually started out with one of two scenes. It was either Nostradamus sitting at a desk, a guy dressed up as Nostradamus, or it was a flood, a big flood, and it was usually hitting New York. Those poor New Yorkers always get it in the apocalypse. Uh, and it really bothered me because you always heard about these savage Maya and they killed children and they were predicting the end of the world in 2012. And it really was upsetting to me because that wasn't my reality of the Maya world. And so I got more and more upset. And every time I would see one of these documentaries, and there were so many, I, I kept thinking, why is no one telling the truth? I didn't know what the truth was, but I knew it wasn't that. I knew Nostradamus wasn't connected to it. Um, and I got so upset, really, I would watch these documentaries and I would find myself becoming teary-eyed. And one day I discovered that I can't sit back and be so angry with everyone else who's not doing something to get to the bottom of what I thought must have been the truth if I'm not willing to do it myself. And so, despite the fact that I had absolutely no money, I had gone bankrupt and really lost everything that I had, I had never made a film, no film experience or schooling, I thought, okay, if no one else is going to do this, I will. And this was the result. It took uh, 18 months from start to completion. We filmed in six countries. And I'm just thrilled to be able to bring these people's messages um, all around the world now and that people like you come out and see us on beautiful days like this. So thank you for having me and for um, looking at the wonderful teachings that are contained within this film. Thank you so much, Shannon. So Jean, I'm gonna ask you the next question, but let me tell you a little bit about Jean. So Jean ran off and married a Maya. <laughs> That's not the official bio. <laughs> But she's married to Mar uh, Mar Martin Pos Perez, who is Don Roberto's brother, actually. Um, uh, but he has moved up here, son. He's, he's a, a Quiche Maya from Guatemala. And I'm going to butcher some of these um, Mayan. They were trying to teach me how to say things correctly. And it's, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> They're trying to, and it's really difficult to say some of the, the Mayan um, words. So they will say them correctly, though. I'm not an expert. That's why they're here. Um, she's the author of Contemporary Maya Spirituality, The Ancient Ways Are Not Lost. And she's a lecturer in ethnic studies right here at Santa Clara University. Um, so, and she has a PhD from Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. And she's done quite a bit of ethnographic research on a lot of the Maya calendar keepers. And she's also one of the consultants, a couple of them here are consultants for the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian and, um, and on the Living Maya Project. So she lectures locally and internationally. She lives here in Berkeley with two um, of her, not with her adult children, I think they're out, but <laughs> she has two adult children. So a lot of people, we're going to give you the end of the world question, Jean, because a lot of people think for some reason that 2012 marks the end of the world. And where, where did that whole concept come from? I would like to add one thing to introduce myself, because I want to say some thank you to people here in San Jose and what a wonderful place this is, and then I'll answer that question. I taught ESL here um, a couple decades ago, and I met a young woman, Calixta, who was from Guatemala, and uh, the military had killed her three brothers and burned her parents' cornfield. And she was taken in by the sanctuary movement here. And she had such a sense of loss within herself. And I would accompany her to the mountains here in San Jose with fire material. And I had never prayed before a fire here, and I never understood it. But Calixta really introduced me people who have been marginalized and people who were lost and found in San Jose a home led me in a sense um, not only to the richness of Maya culture to an ancient spirituality yes introduced me to my husband 
And um, later on, I was able through a Fulbright to go with my husband and our two children to Guatemala. And in the process, worked with 30 Akehap through Don Roberto and published a book that is called Contemporary Maya Spirituality, where I interviewed over 30 women and men ages 14 to 80. Why did you become a, a, a calendar keeper? What does it mean to be a calendar keeper? And really to look very deeply at what is ancient spirituality that in the last 20 years has become public. So to answer your question now about why the apocalypse, the whole idea of apocalyptic literature really began in post-exile uh, for the, the Jewish, when Jewish people were in exile, was picked up by early Christians the first hundred years, and was very much part of the Middle Age idea of the end times and that it would be an unveiling or a revelation of something. And it's curious that the idea of the end times happened, um, a lot of the uh, teaching of it happened during the period when the Spanish came to the New World. There's something curious about the apocalypse, and that is there's a paradox. One, it's appealing idea because it offers salvation to a few people who share a secret knowledge and a world that is redeemed from evil. It's really curious that this idea of the apocalypse really gained uh, energy and flame here in the United States particularly. We saw it from the 18, actually earlier with the Masons in the 1700s. People were really interested in kind of some of the exoticism of Egyptians and of Hindus and of Mayas. But then in the 1820s to 1870s, we see a lot of Protestant evangelical movements, Anabaptists, Calvinists, and Puritanism, that really began to anticipate an apocalyptic time. In fact, in a recent poll, 50% of North Americans believe there will be a rapture. Um, believe there will be an argument. So this is like part of our consciousness here, not part of the Maya. Um, we also see in the 1970s that there were um, a lot of the evangelicals, Pat Robertson, Jerry Falwell, that began to talk about a second coming. We saw the Apocalypto, Mel Gibson, Sensational 2012, and I believe, is it something like 25,000 books have been written about 2012? I mean, it's been really something that people have been able to um, make some money on. So, uh, I have another minute or two? Okay, thank you. So, who, kind of where did this idea come from? Well, there's actually about four sources that this came from. Uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, there was a lot of really wonderful breakthroughs in terms of reading Mayan hieroglyphs and people that were beginning to do work on monuments. And, you know, it's, it's just like all of us, when we think we have an idea, we think we have it right, sometimes we don't. So sometimes people read it, I'm not going into specifics here, but people may have read a glyph and they said, oh, it means the end. So there were misinterpretations that people maybe 10 years later would say, oh, you know, I misinterpreted that. But unfortunately at that point, by the end of the 1970s, it had been released into the world. And it sometimes was picked up by the New Age movement. So one of the reasons was the kind of great interest in the Mayas in the 1970s and 80s. Frank Waters in the uh, 1960s and 70s wrote a book on the Hopi prophecy and this kind of began the idea that there would be a new age of consciousness. And this was picked up specifically by Jose Arguez, who began uh, looking at the harmonic convergence that was happening in terms of, of planets and began to create uh, a number of festivals or ceremonies and writing many, many books talking about this new age of consciousness. Uh, John Major Jenkins, who we've met here, uh, independent scholar, has done a lot of work on his own looking at the relationship of science and monuments. So why did this catch on when we look at, um, we look at the interest in Maya, we look at the New Age movement, uh, we look at the fact that in North America we have an idea of the apocalypse or kind of the end times. Um, the question is, why do we hand our destiny over to someone else? And I think the end of this particular film really calls us that we recognize that, uh, I think this calls us to a great time of a beginning of something new. There is a shift of consciousness going on. And rather than turn it over to some kind of fear and panic, which is what some of these processes might do, to actually say that maybe this is a shift of consciousness to take control of, not control, but responsibility in the world we live in.
Yeah, that cartoon kind of sums it up there. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 so next we have Dr. Isabel Hawkins, and she's very impressive <laughs> woman here. She's astronomer and educator. Uh, she has her PhD in astronomy from UCLA, and she spent 20 years as a researcher and science educator at UC Berkeley. She's um, currently at the Exploratorium, and she has d she's um, hosted the museum's live webcast from Chichen Itza in uh, Yucatan on Maya astronomy. And she has um, she's published over a hundred articles on astronomy and education. It's very impressive. And she's also received the Astronomical Society of the Pacific's Klumke Roberts Award for her work in astronomy. And what I love about her is all you people that know me, she likes salsa dancing. So, <laughs> so um, what is the significance of the galactic alignment on December 21st or 22nd? And what's this phenomenon? What's the connection between the earth, the sky, and the people? Can you explain that? Thank you very much, Darlene. I, I would like to thank uh, all of you wonderful audience for being here tonight. I think that that made this possible, the fact that you're interested in my culture and in my astronomy, my wisdom, just like we all are here. We're immersed in it in many different ways at various levels, uh, but I think all with good heart, and I think it shows, and we thank your presence, and I also want to thank the organizers um, for having us uh, here tonight. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to focus on the galactic alignment because I, I figured I'm an astronomer. I can give you the facts of the galactic alignment from an astronomical perspective. I, I would not uh, uh, pretend that I can give you the Maya in, uh, perspective since I am not Maya and I don't have that expertise. So uh, I will just tell you about the astronomical uh, facts. And I wanted to show a few images. Um, first of all, we have right here uh, an image of an equinox alignment during sunrise at a Maya temple called Civil Chaltun, which means written in stone, which is about 10 kilometers north of Merida in the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, have any of you been to this temple? Any? Raise your hands. Several of you. So you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's quite a, an amazing moment to, to be there, stand, standing at sunrise and listening to the birds and smelling the fresh air, the fresh morning air, and this expectation that there is something is about to happen, this clarity behind the temple, and all of a sudden, boom, there's the sun shining through the temple as if you see the face of the sun itself peering through this portal. So the idea that the Maya were accomplished astronomers, and frankly, they continue to be accomplished astronomers through the oral tradition and their understanding of the movements of the sun and the stars for practical as well as ceremonial purposes is unquestioned. Um, another image, please. Um, another uh, equinox alignment takes place at the Pyramid of El Castillo. Uh, Kukulkan descends on uh, March uh, 20th and September 22nd, depending on what, what the orbits are doing. But at any rate, you have two times of the year in which it appears as if a serpent is sliding down the, bal the balustrade of the pyramid. And this takes about 40 minutes. And again, the local Maya and the um, contemporary Maya tell us that Kukulkan or the feather serpent represents the umbilicus or the link between the earth and the sky and it's the time that separates the dry time uh, from the wet time uh, in the Yucatan and it prepares the earth for planting. So Kukulkan, the feather serpent, is bringing the energy of the earth for planting. So again, it is evidence that through their understanding of astronomy, of architecture, and the connection between earth and sky, the ancient Maya were able to align their structures so that they would serve as uh, observatories uh, to be able to predict and record the seasons. The next image shows that there are other uh, astronomical phenomena that are very important in this particular latitude, which is a latitude between the tropics, which is called the zenith passage of the sun. It is an astronomical phenomenon in which the sun appears directly overhead at midday. And practically, you can observe this because all 
uh, shadows from vertical objects disappear. So the zenith passage is a very precise moment in time and place that allowed the ancient Maya and other uh, uh, Mesoamerican peoples of antiquity, including the Zapotecs in Oaxaca, for example, to measure the length of the solar year very precisely. So the ancients knew that the solar year was more than just 365 days, that there was a fraction of a day that we now take into account through a leap year uh, when we add an extra day, but they knew this fraction to a greater accuracy than we know now with the Gregorian calendar that we use on a, on a daily basis. So again, their expertise is unquestioned as excellent astronomers. So one more. And here we see the evidence of the, of the Zenith Passage um, in an alignment at Palenque, which shows the, this particular temple in the palace being aligned to the time of, of sunrise of the Zenith Passage on that day. So um, there were just all sorts of um, ways in which the Maya were able to express their understanding of, of the connection between the earth and the sky. So now, we're going to the next slide, which is the prediction of this galactic alignment. So all of this preamble is just to you know, make us really focus on what I believe is important, which is that the Maya were and continue to be great astronomers and great scientists, and that they are able to understand the cycles of the universe in a way that is useful for them for practical reasons, agriculture, for example, but also for ceremonial reasons. So the prediction, and we've seen this um, prediction in, in many forms, is basically that the sun will align with the galactic plane, will be uh, aligned with the center of the galaxy as seen from Earth on December 21st, 2012, which is of course the winter solstice, and that something will happen, <laughs> that something has been uh, uh, you know, expanded to be anything from nothing to uh, explosions from the center of the galaxy to great doom to catastrophes, etc. So, but what are the astronomical facts of this phenomenon? So basically, here's an image, and I'm gonna turn around. <laughs> here's an image that shows the blue path. It is actually the ecliptic of the path of the sun against the background stars. The band of stars that is more vertically is actually the Milky Way, or our own galaxy the plane of our own galaxy. So when John Major Jenkins talked about this cross in the sky, he was talking about two planes, two planes actually crossing each other, which is what is happening. You have always the plane of the galaxy and the plane of the ecliptic crossing. And since we go around in a circle, the Earth goes around in a circle around the sun, that crossing happens twice a year forever, ever since the creation of the solar system ad infinitum. So this alignment is not special from that point of view. It happens once in December and once in June every year. What is more special is that it is happening, if you see uh, where the arrow is pointing, it says December, well that's December 21st, 2012. So this is an image of a planetarium, done with a planetarium software, that shows the position of the sun projected against the galaxy on this date at the latitude of Chichen Itza. So, is it really special that it's on December 21st? Well, it turns out that even on the winter solstice, this particular alignment it happens consecutively for a period of 400 years. So, no, it is not that special. Uh, on the other hand, Major Jenkins, I noticed his language, he says, it occurs during the era of 2012. He didn't say exactly, he said era, okay, yes, within this 400, Year period. He doesn't want to say 400 years because that kind of diminishes the significance of this. Um, but I would say these are all things that are quite immaterial and from my point of view. I think that the focus that we need to redirect our attention to is away from doomsday prophecies and away from the particulars of whether the Maya knew about this alignment because it was on December 24th first, et cetera, or because it was in the winter solstice, but really focus on the fact that they had the ability to actually make such measurements, that they had the ability to understand precession, that they had the ability to predict seasons and record them, that they had the ability to predict eclipses. I mean, it is unbelievable, the prowess of the Maya, and the fact that day keepers such as Don Roberto and elders such as Doña Maria carry with them oral tradition that allows them to understand the workings of, the, of a sacred calendar of 260 days to this day with extreme precision, 
and that allows her to actually tell me how it is that her ancestors observed the zenith passage of the sun, and, and of course, precisely, you step on your own shadow. So these are the things that we need to focus on. We need to focus on the understanding of the ancients, we need to focus on the understanding of the contemporary Maya, and be proud of their accomplishments, and realize that all the knowledge of science today stands on the shoulders of the accomplishments of this amazing culture that is still thriving to this day. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. So now we have Michael Grove. And you know what? I barely understand what he does, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'm actually going to read his bio. The one thing I do understand that he does is he's an expert in cocoa and what woman doesn't like chocolate. So I like him just for that. <laughs> But that's not what he does for a living all the time, though. His main thing is he's, I'm going to read this, a specialist in hieroglyphic writing. He's an archaeoastronomy and comparative mythology and Kakoa. Dr. Grofe has led multiple field courses in Belize, Mexico, and India. And he's particularly interested in the confluence of mythological narrative and participatory science in Mesoamerica and historical interaction between the traditions of the Maya and Central America. His doctoral research at UC Davis, he explored a new astronomical interpretation of the Serpent Series within the Dresden Codex, and he's currently expanding his research to incorporate the theor theoretical astronomy found in Palenque inscriptions. Dr. Grof has taught numerous courses on the Popol Vuh, I'm saying that correctly, okay, Popol Vuh, and Native American literature, and he's currently teaching cultural anthropology, archeology, span and physical anthropology, at, and I didn't put that, at, that was cut off, were you American teaching? River American River College. And again, he's an expert on, on chocolate. <laughs> but what I wanna ask Michael is, you know, we're hearing about all this astronomical stuff and did the Maya actually understand the astronomical phenomenon of precession? And precession, I think, is a lot of people are talking about is getting knocked off our axis, right? <laughs> axis, people. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, well thank you, and thank you for inviting me here, and uh, it's really been an honor, um, and it's a great turnout. You can see that 2012 certainly sells a lot of tickets, which is an amazing phenomenon. Everybody knows about this now, which is a, an amazing teaching opportunity for us, I think. That's what we're trying to do here. Um, so thanks for coming, and thanks to Shannon, of course, for, uh, for interviewing me in the film, which I was really honored to be asked to do. Um, so, procession, everybody wants to know what it is, and it is a challenging concept to um, speak about. Uh, as you saw in the film, I was speaking about it, and um, if you can look at the first slide, uh, it's something like the animation that you saw, but uh, the Earth, basically, the axis of the Earth and the North Pole points directly right now to, or just about right on to, to the star Polaris. And uh, as I mentioned in the film, 13,000 years from now and 13,000 years ago, the Earth actually had wobbles like a top very, very slowly, and that whole wobble takes about 26,000 years, give or take. And, uh, and so that's what I was showing here. Now, there has been some interest in this, and, and actually it was a Greek astronomer, Hipparchus, that we've attributed the discovery of precession although Hipparchus actually lived right around the same time that the long count was created. So um, I think we also might have to attribute the discovery of procession elsewhere in the world, and that's what I've been working on in my research. This illustration is basically showing you uh, the Earth in the center with uh, an imaginary kind of cosmos around it with the constellations of the zodiac, and the zodiac are the constellations that are found on the, the path of the ecliptic that Isabel was speaking about. Uh, and, and so everybody knows their sun sign, right? What's your sign? We're in California. Uh, so, and that was taken from 2,000 years ago when the sun was directly in front of one of those constellations. But in the past 2,000 years, what has happened is the position of the sun on your birthdays, where your sign was, has actually moved backwards to the previous sign. So I hate to disappoint you that your, your actual sign is quite different from what you think it is. <laughs> But uh, anyway, so it really took a long time. In fact, in all of the astronomy in Europe, uh, they were unaware of precession and they did not subscribe to precession. Even Copernicus, who actually understood that the Earth goes around the sun, um, he did not believe in precession. 
And it was only until uh, Kepler, actually, that we have some really solid data um, and some actual uh, understanding of how precession works. And so basically, every 71 years, the position of the sun on any given day, either your birthday or the winter solstice or the vernal equinox, moves backwards. Many thousands of years ago, the spring equinox was in front of Taurus, and there has been some speculation that uh, the stories of Mithra uh, from ancient Rome were about the understanding of precession. I, there's not so much evidence for that, but it's an interesting idea. Madame Blavatsky, who was actually one of the first New Agers way back in, uh, way back in, in uh, actually the 1800s, she was speaking about uh, the dawning of the age of Aquarius. You've all heard of this, yes? You've seen hair. Um, and so what that is, is the movement of the, the, the vernal equinox sun. As it is passing, it's gone from Taurus and then back to Aries and to Pisces, where it is right now. And it is slowly moving into the, in front of Aquarius, or basically the Earth is moving so that the sun looks like it's in front of Aquarius. And that's because of this backward movement that we call precession, or precession of the equinoxes. It's really precession of all of the days of the year against the stars. So uh, next slide, please. So I'll click it one more time. There we go. So one of the things that I've been researching is evidence for whether the Maya understood precession. And uh, I found now, accumulated a lot of data showing, uh, such as on this monument, this is Naranjo Altar 1. And uh, if you click through this, it will show you uh, various birthdays. Is the animation going to happen? Oh, no, it's not. OK, so that's fine. This is basically uh, one of the dates on Naranjo Altar 1, which is uh, a back calculated date to a long time be uh, before, actually 100 years or so before this, the king that uh, inscribed this monument was around, and his name was Ahosa. And so that particular date counts with a very large distance number, about 700 and some years before that. And it places the sun, next slide please, directly in the exact same spot, and this happens to be in front of the constellation Pisces, and that's not what I, this is about, but it's exactly the same spot in the sky, but it's a different time of year. And this particular time of year is very significant because it's the solar nadir, which is exactly opposite the August 13th zenith at, at a particular latitude where the two zeniths are 260 days apart. Um, not only is it exactly on this nadir, it's also exactly on a lunar node, which means there would have been an eclipse at this time. And you have the heliacal rise of Venus as morning star. All of these things are showing intentionality. And so what I'm doing is accumulating all of these different texts that have very large distance numbers. And many of them seem to take into account the sidereal year, which is an understanding of precession by placing the sun in the same spot of the sky. So up now, I, can somebody get my phone out of my per I need to keep track of time and I forgot to bring my phone up here. So, but Don Roberto has no time limit because we're so excited that he's here. So Don Roberto Pos, Perez, let's give him a big hand for being here again. Aquí. He is an Aki, which is a cal Maya calendar keeper and spiritual guide. He lives in Zenil Quetzaltenango in Highland, Guatemala. It's 100% indigenous where he lives, and his native language is Quiche. And for more than 30 years, he has dedicated himself to guiding others through the Maya sacred 260-day calendar and through ceremonial practice. He... Um, He's founded Comon Tohil, and I'm probably saying that incorrectly, which is, is it right? Okay, yay. Uh, it's a network of, again, Mayan spiritual guys in the Quetzalcoatl um, area. He's respected not only in Guatemala, but really in Central South America and all over North America. He also collaborated on the Living Maya Time with the Smithsonian Institute that they worked on. And um, we're very excited that he's here. It's, takes, it's, it's quite a challenge to bring people here sometimes. And I do want to give a shout out to Zoe Lofgren's office, Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren, because she really helped us um, bring Don Roberto here. So um, I'm going to have, and Isabel is going to be translating for both Doña Maria and Don Roberto, but we're going to have Don Roberto speak first, and we're going to have him explain what exactly does a calendar 
keeper do? He would like to begin with a, a prayer. Kimartushik Chalani Malak Kahawal, Alak Sakul, Alak Bitur, Alakalom, Alak Kahalom, Kamartushik Bachela, Kalaklo Kamulim Kip, Chirlok Loha, Kolibar, Kalaklo Chirlok Lotinimit, Hebaluk Kanan Katat, Rimilik the Irk, Chorika Kolibar, Shabaluki or Kamartushik Bachela. Kalaklos Sakrik, Pakunik, Chirlokloka, Chirlokloko Chulata, Chalakil Kamak, Shalakan, Shalakabla, Chichi, and Lakjochana. Quisiera agradecer a esta invitación que se me hizo a todo el personal que está trabajando con toda esta actividad muy grande y a la vez. Quisiera decirles que hoy, en nuestro día que nos marca el calendario maya, el 13 Tijash, en el mes Sek, y en el año 5128. He would like to begin by thanking the organizers and everybody who made it possible for him to be here today, and, and thanking your presence. And uh, he wanted uh, to discuss the significance of uh, today's date, according to the Maya calendar, which is the day is 13 Tihash, the month is Ke, and the year is 5,128. Quisiera decirles que muchas gracias por eh, compartir con ustedes mi trabajo como Ajij, como contador del tiempo, he wanted to uh, thank you for uh, giving him the chance to share his work as a, a counter of the days, or achkir, like they call it in his Kiché language. Mi trabajo es de agradecerle a la madre naturaleza por todas las, uh, por todo lo que está a nuestro alrededor. His work involves to thank all of Mother Nature uh, for everything, all the blessings that we have around us. Tenemos las celebraciones como el Día del Huachakibat, el Día de la Mujer, el Día de los Niños, el Día de la Casa. We have uh, several celebrations, including what we call the Huachakibat, uh, also the Day of the Woman, the Day of Children, and the Day of the Home. También mi trabajo es tra eh, con la comunidad, eh, haciendo limpias, por enfermedades, por situaciones económicas, por situaciones de trabajo. So the other uh, type of work that I do is I support my community, uh, helping them with uh, cleansing ceremonies because of situations of illness or because of difficulties of, at work or at home or in the community. También uh, pedimos, eh, hago este, los trabajos en donde también para las construcciones de de las casas, para construcciones de carreteras, por instalaciones de agua potable, hacer estas solicitudes a la Madre Tierra para que no haya percance en las actividades. Uh, the other type of work that I do is that I uh, work with people uh, when they're doing any kind of construction, like constructing a home or constructing a, a big road project or um, trying to uh, install uh, systems of potable water so that I can ask permission of Mother Earth for these works to be conducted. También solicitar el agua para nuestro sustento diario, que es el maíz. Eh, también agradecer a la Madre Tierra porque nos da ese sustento cada día y por todo lo que está a nuestro alrededor, a las montañas, a los cerros, a los tem en, en los templos, la sabiduría que han dejado Nuestros abuelos. And also, um, I give thanks, um, thanks for the sacred uh, food, our corn, um, and for the fact that we have the mountains, we have the hills, uh, we have the caves, and we have all of the knowledge that our ancestors left us. Quisiera decirles también que nosotros vemos, uh, más que todo, tengo las, uh, ese don de ver eh, cómo coincidir con las parejas. Eh, cuando se casan, eh, 
hacen sus consultas para ver si la joven y el joven son compatibles, es orientarlos sobre lo que es el calendario. I also have this gift, a gift of uh, being able to give counsel to uh, couples as they're going to marry and be able to help them see if they're going to be compatible according to our Maya calendar. También uh, hacemos eh, el apoyo uh, con toda la comunidad para poder uh, orientarlos a una vida mejor, a uh, un apoyo de sus días, qué es el, en sí el Nahual, qué es lo que significa cada uno de estos días del de calendario sagrado que consta de 260 días. Uh, the other work that we do is to give counsel to my community. Community members come and I can orient them. I can orient their, their path in life according to the Maya calendar, uh, depending on which uh, uh, Nahual or uh, calendar uh, day they were, they were born and what will be their, their path depending on the qualities of the day. Pues uh, también nosotros eh, para el, ese día que tantos eh, hemos esperado, el 13 Bactún, vamos a realizar una peregrinación. Oh, so we, we have uh, been all awaiting with great anticipation uh, the end of the 13 Bactún and we're going to, to conduct uh, an event or a ceremony. Lo vamos a iniciar desde el 18 de, de diciembre a, a realizar a ceremonias. We will begin on the 18th of December to conduct ceremonies. Que el 18 vamos a estar en un lugar que se llama um, Abaktakalik. On the 18th of December we're going to be at a place called Abaktakalik. Eh, nos eh, iremos a conducir a Kiriwa. We will go to the archaeological site of Kiriwa or the sacred site of Kiriwa. Y después nos trasladaremos en, en Tikal. And then we will go to Tikal. Porque lo que estamos eh, entendiendo es de que va a terminar un conteo más. Because we understand mm. that uh, there will be an end to some of our counting. Y todos somos tan dichosos de recibir este nuevo conteo o el nuevo Bactún. And we are all very fortunate to be able to receive the new counting or the new Bactún. Y es tan, y, uh, y, uh, me conmueve mucho el corazón que dentro de tanto uh, eh, estudiosos que han encontrado eh, un significado, una respuesta de todos los escritos de nuestros abuelos. Me impresiona bastante. And it gladdens my heart uh, to see that so many uh, people with a lot of um, academic preparation and people who have been studying our culture have been able to find a significance to this important date. Y a la vez agradezco a todo esta a, a todos los organizadores de esta actividad porque la están haciendo con mucha armonía. Y aquí a los, a los presentes también quisiera agradecerles por escucharnos y también que a Jao, que le llamamos a ese Dios, que nos reine de muchas bendiciones, que haya mucha paz, mucha armonía y que haya mucha humildad en nuestros corazones para seguir viviendo con esa gran uh, inquietud y esa gran armonía. Muchas gracias. And he said that he would like to thank the organizers because he, he sees, he feels that this whole event was put together with great harmony and that all of you present here uh, exude this harmony, this peace. And so he's very gladdened in his heart and he knows that this event is going, is going to be a, a good event. And so he's very pleased to be here and he wants to thank the Ahau, which is, uh, he called it the, our deity, um, for all of his blessings so that we could be here today. Dije también que hoy que marca el calendario eh, 13 Tihash. Es un día muy, eh, para nosotros, muy significativo para hacer las limpias de las personas, para enfermedades, para cosas muy, uh, muy personales, como también para proyectos, como también para que nuestra familia 
esté con mucha alegría. Es un día muy especial para la meditación. So today, uh, 13 Tihash, is a very special day. It is a wonderful day to begin a project. It's a wonderful uh, day to do cleansing ceremonies. It's a wonderful day for our families to come together. Um, so he's very pleased that, that we are, we're here on, on this day, uh, 13 Tihash. Y así serán, digamos, los, los otros 19 días que cada un día, cada día tiene su influencia, tiene también su, su don para curar, para la inteligencia y para la manera de expresarnos en toda esta sabiduría que tiene nuestro calendario. This is our calendar, all the other, nine, the other 19 days of our calendar, along with Tikash making the 20 days. It says, all, each day has its wisdom, each day has a guiding Um, that will teach us how to, how to live through life in a way that is harmonious. And so it says that is the, the essence of the wisdom of their 260-day uh, sacred calendar. Quisiera platicar más, sabemos que todo está muy medido, pero agradezco a Isabel de haberme traducido este pequeño mensaje que les traigo a cada uno de ustedes. Thank you, he wants to thank for the translation. He said that he's very sorry that we have very limited time, but he's... Thank, very thankful. Again, we're so honored to have Don Roberto here, and, and I just feel like a sense of peacefulness when he talks. I just feel it, and I, I see Isabel getting teary-eyed, and I got kind of teary-eyed as myself. We're going to introduce you to, we have very limited time and we probably are not going to be able to get to questions just so you know because we want to give the elders as much time as possible to speak. Um, Doña Maria Avila, um, she was born in Sul and raised in Peto, Yucatan, Mexico. She is, oh, let me put this picture of the screen up here. She is a mother of 11. I, she needs a big hand just for that. <laughs> I think if you're a mother of 11, that should be on your card, your bumper sticker, everything. <laughs> and she's, I was saying, she's just so huggable, like when I first met her. And, and, and the reason why we wanted to bring Don Maria here today, Doña Maria, is because um, she's, you know, the mother, and she's a grandmother. And, and she's really on, as we know, in, in our families, the mothers carry on most of the culture and the traditions, um, except for my father, of course, he does. <laughs> um, but... And I, we wanted to ask her, you know, what did she learn from her grandmother and from her mother? And what is her and, and, I, um, and what is her children and grandchildren and how have the customs or traditions changed? Because now they're living in, a, in America now, some of them. And so I wanted to ask you as a parent and as, as a teacher, how are you carrying on your ancestry? Muy buenas tardes. Y les voy a hablar un poco de mi idioma, que es la maya yucateca. Es achmalo bubin que en wet la que lees, achkima que en wo anilenta bukina lees, tu mente ne achta ustint an ne talenin chikbate ese un pit basukas bateni abuelos. En primer lugar, como les dije, muy buenas tardes, estoy aquí muy orgullosamente a traerles un poco de lo que mis abuelos me tienen enseñado. Y también estoy muy orgullosa de que esta señorita que ven por acá, es en 37 nietos, es la primera que, que baila el baile cultural de Yucatán. Y... Hachikima Kimola Kanganesh Waye, Titulaka Titesh, Tile Shuna Nova, tu invitarte Nova. Estoy muy contenta en que ustedes están escuchando y interesados por todo lo de nuestra cultura, que nos traen, que nos traen como por ejemplo las pirámides, que es muy, algo muy bonito para aprender. Muchas gracias. I was, I was nudging her, please let me translate because there's so much information. <laughs> But, uh, 
she she began speaking in Yucatec Maya. Uh, did did you notice that uh, she introduced herself in her native language, and um, she basically said she's very pleased to be here and that she's very happy to be able to share a little bit of the knowledge of her ancestors, but um, that she would like to thank, of course, the organizers um, to have her here. Uh, she thanks her presence, and she said the young lady on the right-hand side is actually um, the granddaughter who's actually carrying the uh, knowledge of the traditional dance, the Harana dance of the Yucatan, and she's very happy. She has 37 grandchildren and, um, and 10, 10 children, um, so she's, she's very happy that, that this is happening, and, and uh, that's how she carries. Sí. Yo, este, yo soy una persona, tengo 73 años, Y tengo 10 hijos varones, 37 nietos y 10 bisnietos. All these numbers. Uh, she has 73, she is 73 years old. She has uh, 10 uh, sons and she has 37 grandchildren. ¿Y cuántos bisnietos? Yes. And 10 great grandchildren. Y estoy muy orgullosa de estar con ustedes, con ustedes portando mi, mi traje que es desde de mi, de mi niñez y otros conocimientos que, que me han enseñado mis abuelos. Mi abuelita de parte de mi papá era partera. I'm here very proud wearing my indigenous dress that I've worn since I was a child. Um, and I also wanted to share with you the knowledge of my grandmother on my father's side, who was a midwife. Y en esas épocas, en el pueblito donde vivíamos, era, ella era la única persona que recibía los bebés, como el trabajo que hace el hermano Don Roberto. Ella recibía los bebés sin doctor, sin nada, todo natural. Ella le cortaba el obligo a los bebés con la cañada de, de la mata de los elotes. It says, my grandmother um, was the only one who could, could bring the children to, to the world in my, in my town. And she did this uh, completely naturally. And in the same way that, you know, Don Roberto serves his community, she served her community. And she would cut the umbilical cord of the children using a sharpened piece of the corn stalk. Y para hacer el, el huequito de las orejas, lo hacía con un espino que en, en nuestro pueblo se llama subim. And uh, she used to pierce ears with a natural spine in our uh, town called Suri. Subim. Y era para mí que tenía yo como seis años, para cuando yo empecé a ver, me empecé a dar cuenta era algo muy que me daba miedo, ¿no? Pero me decía, no tengas miedo, me dice. Estos son cosas que no va a pasar nada. Y la admiro ahora en mi vejez, porque en realidad es algo muy muy delicado, pero ellos sabían por qué lo hacían. She says, I used to see her work, and as a child of six years of age, I used to sometimes be afraid of the things that she had to do, you know. Um, but she told me, never be afraid. These are all things we're meant to do. These are, this is all about life. And so now that I'm older, I appreciate her teachings. Y este, y otra cosa que también ellos... Yo he visto muchas cosas, por ejemplo, en que hablaron del sol, la luna, las estrellas. Ahorita lo estamos viendo con, con la doctora Isabel, que he aprendido muchas cosas de ella también. She says there are things also that my grandmother told me about the sun, the moon, and the stars. And now that we work together, she's trying, she's starting to see more connections. Y eso como que me ha despertado un poco de mis sentidos, ¿no? De, de saber cuán importante es la luna, el sol, las estrellas. And it's awakened in me another, a sense of wonder and uh, to really appreciate the importance of the sun, the moon, and the stars to our ancestors. 
Por ejemplo, el sol ellos lo utilizaban para los horarios del día. Pues los campesinos no tenían reloj, no tenían nada y se guiaban ellos de las horas de cómo era el movimiento del sol. Por ejemplo, a las 12 del día, cuando ellos ven que ya la sombra está en medio, son las 12 del día para ellos. Y si está algo nublado, lo van a ver en el sol, en el, el sol, en el pozo. It says to know about when the sun was above the midday, it says that we knew that our shadow was all around us. And also when, if it was cloudy, they could just look down the well and see the image of the sun reflected at the bottom. Y en las estrellas, cuando las tres de la mañana sale la estrella mayor, para ellos son las tres de la mañana cuando la estrella mayor aparece. Y de ahí se van guiando cuando baje la estrella hasta llegar al punto de amanecer a las seis de la mañana, es que el sol ya está saliendo. Y para ellos ya es hora de que se vayan a sus milpas. Uh, she remembers that also there was a gui they guided themselves by looking at the, the great st uh, star. She calls it the great star. And in, in Maya, it's called Nohoch Ek, which means the great star. We now know it's Venus, you know. But she knows about the great star. Then I tell her, oh, that's Venus. And then we just kind of have this conversation. And uh, she said that her, uh, the people, the, um, the campesinos or the farmers, would look at the, when the star was... Uh, at 3 a.m., they could see the star above the horizon, but then as the, as, as the star went down to the horizon, that's when the sun came up. That was 6 a.m., and they knew they had to go work in the milpas. Y como dijo el hermano Roberto, hay mucho que compartir, pero ya el tiempo. Y les agradezco mucho y muchas gracias por haber nos invitado a todos los presentes, a todos los, los dirigentes a nuestro hermano Roberto que vino a compartir con nosotros, a la doctora Isabel que, que ha aprendido muchas cosas de ella y a las señoritas que nos han invitado. Tal vez pero Les agradezco mucho que nos hayamos encontrado aquí, de haber conocido gente tan hermosa, con caras muy cariñosas, los llevo en mi corazón. Says for, there's a lot of lack of time, and she just has a lot of people to thank, including the organizers, of course, but also Don Roberto, because they know each other. Um, and he, she's so happy to see him again, and she wants to thank all of us here, but especially all of you who have such kind faces, and she'll carry all of you in her heart. So thank you. Y aquí vi a una, a una amiga que está portando su, su traje regional. Felicidades, amiga. Felicidades por portar ese traje tan hermoso de nuestro Yucatán. Gracias a todos. She's wearing her traditional dress, so she must be from the Yucatan, so she wants to say thank you for wearing her traditional dress. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. So I, I feel like I'm the bearer of the bad news because we have to wrap this up. Um, and it's been so wonderful, and I would love to hear more from them. Um, but we do have to wrap it up, and they actually have another event coming in. I do want to give you the website and the information for Shannon. They just, um, the, the DVDs just went on sale today. So if you go to her website, you can purchase the DVD for the film. Also, we want to again thank all of the panelists that were here today. Let's give them a really big hand. And we also want to thank, of course, Marcella Davison Aviles, who's executive director of VivaFest, Elizabeth Williams from the Tech Museum, me, 
Grant, <laughs> Grant, who's back there, who makes everything happen technically, and all his staff, they make things flow. Um, we want to thank Sal Arciniega, who helped consult. He's back there. He's a chef, helped consult on the menu today. Um, Monica Ramos, who's executive assistant and just is always taking every phone call. And again, Zoe Lofgren for her help. Um, for those of you that are going to the event, and just so you know, you uh, we're not going to you are not going to be able to speak to the panelists after this event because we do need to go to another event um, right now, and we're running a little over. So unfortunately, you will not be able to speak, and we really ask for you to respect that and to not come up to the speakers after the show. Um, after this presentation, for those of you that are going to the Maya Calendar event, I think we have like eight tickets left. If you want to. Um, purchase a ticket. Again, Lori, stand up Lori. Lori's selling raffle tickets again for that playhouse that's out front. And if you, there's like maybe eight people could, that could still go to the dinner and the dinner, all the panelists will be there and you have an opportunity to speak to them there. But I think we have about eight tickets left, just so you know. Um, no, you do not need to be present to win. And actually we were going to draw the winner today um, on the playhouse. Yeah. So you want to purchase do that and then let's see and that is it so again thank all of you really i i felt <laughs> i want to again um if don roberto doña maria si, si puedes levantar. i want to really give them a big hand and i'll give all of you before them coming this far and sharing